Hey guys, welcome back to the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have with me today a paranormal investigator. I have with me Mike Sears. He's with the Volunteer State Paranormal Group. Um, Mike has had paranormal experiences most of his life, starting at the very age of five. And he saw his first ghost of a little girl appearing in his bedroom when he lived in upstate New York. Mike has had other occurrences throughout his life that happened. Um, from these experiences, it fueled his passion to learn more about the paranormal field. In 2006, Mike joined a paranormal investigating team in Middle Tennessee with his wife, Monique. During that time, he learned that various ways of investigating and being able to help others understand what they might be experiencing. Mike has been investigating the paranormal since 2006 and has worked with various paranormal teams in the Middle Tennessee state area. And we're going to get more into all the other stuff that he's done because it, it goes on from there. But he has a really long bio, but he's been on the Travel Channel history. Um, he's won Paranormal Acknowledgement Awards. I mean, he's he's the real deal, too. He's like what I call the real McCoy. That's why I wanted to have him on the show. And I want to give him a big, warm welcome. Mike, thank you for joining me. How are you? Oh, good. Thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Um, so I guess we all get fueled by this passion that we have for the paranormal, but Yours was a little bit different because you actually experienced stuff like I'll just tell you, like my experiences were very limited. You know, I, I saw an old hag once you know, when I was like really young and that, that kind of maybe sparked my interest a little bit. But it wasn't until I started hearing Art Bell that really got me you know, more interested in the paranormal. And that kind of brought back memories of ghost stories from my youth. Um, were you into Art Bell or what, 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 was it more like your, your personal experiences that fueled your interest for the paranormal? Um, it was mostly my personal experiences. And then later on, I discovered, you know, the Art Bell and uh, listened to his shows and hear other people learning that, you know, I'm not alone, that there's other people out there that are having these experiences also. Yeah. Now, but did you have experiences with what we would call aliens as well or just um, ghosts? Um, ghosts is, is mostly ghosts. I had like an encounter when I was 13. My mom and I um, saw an unidentifying object um, one night when I was coming back from martial arts class. I was 13. Well, you and... know what's interesting about that? I, I'm sorry. I was going to say most people that, that see the paranormal also see UFOs. So that's awesome that you, okay, you yeah. didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no problem. Yeah, that was the only encounter I remember is that would be, I would say, alien. I remember when we got home, we explained it to my dad and he's like, yeah, sure. You saw a ball of light in the air. And I was like, no, it came out of this field and just shot straight up in the air. And then later that night, we're watching the late evening news. It was outside uh, Rochester, New York. And they said that they were getting all kinds of phone calls from other people that saw it. And um, the news media um, brushed it off as saying it was uh, spotlights from a, a car dealership that was having a grand opening. And I'm like, uh, we're like, 25 miles from that car dealership that's some amazing spotlights you know to come out of that field it was a farmer's field so the next day my mom and i drove down to that farmer's field and we saw a big burnt out patch out in the field big circle 360 circle out there oh. and and we said i don't think that was there you know in the past uh, that's new for me so that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so um, how did your, I didn't want to read too much of your bio because I wanted you to be able to tell your stories. Like right. um, you have some pretty amazing ghost encounters. Can you get into all of them? Like when did they start the, the ghost encounters? Um, my first encounter was when I was five, when I, uh, my parents lived up in the Finger Lake region of uh, New York and uh, we lived on Canisius Lake. And um, I saw a little girl that was Victorian. I had gone to bed and um, felt like I was being watched. And when I rolled over on my bed, there was a little girl in a white dress, black curly hair, um, sitting in a chair looking at me and she waved at me. And I thought first, maybe my sisters are playing a joke and she didn't disappear and it wasn't my sisters. And so I rolled over being scared and um, all of a sudden I could feel like someone was standing there next to my bed. And when I rolled over there, she was looking right at me face to face. Oh so I screamed God. and ran down the stairs as fast as I could. And my parents were like, what's going on? And I explained what I saw. And they, they chalked it up as, you know, active imagination. And um, over the years, I saw other ghosts, you know, from relatives that passed away that just, you know, appeared in my bedroom or somewhere in the house. And but 1994 was the big life-changing experiences that I had. What happened there? Um, well, the first, I started with my dad. Um, my dad uh, was battling cancer, and we had him under uh, hospice care at home. And uh, 
during that time, his health got worse and and the the nurse explained that uh, she felt he was going to pass away that night. And she asked if we wanted them to stay that night because they were scheduled to be off that night. They worked every other night. My mom and I would take shifts to take care of them. And um, my mom says, no, she's got it. And uh, so I told her, I said, if he does pass away, wake me up, let me know. Or if you need me. And um, so she was there about 3.30 in the morning. She said he passed away. And she checked his pulse and heard his last breath and, and, um, she grieved for about a half hour and, um, she went to go wake me. And before she could leave the room, my dad sat up out of the bed and said, where are you going? I need to talk to you. And what oh shocked her. God. Yeah. He was like in a coma for almost a week, you know? And prior to that, he was extremely weak and, you know, he had to be hand fed and, um, he talked, you know, real soft if he could talk, you know? Um, so here he is risen out of the bed, you know, nice skin tone and color looked healthy. And he says, look, I, I begged him for the, to have me come back. So I could tell you and Mike that everything's okay. And you don't have to worry about me after I pass away. So they ended up talking to almost seven o'clock in the morning. And he's telling her all this stuff from other relatives that have passed away and things that he witnessed. And, um, my mom was saying that uh, his first wife had passed away in 1963 from cancer. She was Japanese. And my dad spoke fluent Japanese to her, interpreted back and forth to her and my mom. And uh, one of the messages was that she told my mom that thank you for taking care of him on this side, that she was going to take care of him on the other side. And by that time, it was almost like seven o'clock after that she'd done all this talking with him. She's like, well, let me go wake up Mike. And my dad's like, well, before you do, I like to freshen up. I want to take a shower. And here he got out of the bed on his own and walked to his own bedroom and took a shower. And she went to wake me up and said, hey, uh, dad wants to talk to you, which really shocked the hell out of me. And um, said, uh, you need to get up, you know, and talk to him. And I was like, is everything OK? And she's like, well, I'll let you see for yourself. So I got out of bed and I start heading to the living room where he had the hot the hospital bed. And um, he wasn't there. And she's like, no, he's not in, in there. He's in his own bed, which shocked me. And uh, so I went in there and see him in bed. And he looked, you know, healthy. He, he wasn't pale. He did look sick. And um, he talked to me and told me everything was going to be OK. And he didn't want me to worry about him after he passed away. And we talked about a half hour. And he, you know, asked me if I had any questions. At the time, I was in total shock. I didn't know what to ask. And, um, but say, when, did you ask any questions about the afterlife or what did you guys No, nah, I just didn't, I didn't even think of it at the time. I was just, just in shock seeing him talking and in bed. And, um, so I had asked him, I, I said, well, you've had it, you know, you've had it rough, you know, you've been battling cancer on and off for 10 years. And he goes, well, I haven't had it rough. And this would blew me away. My dad was not a church goer. Um, he was not, you know, religious that I recall as a kid. And if you ever heard him say Jesus, it was because he was cussing. And um, so when I said he's had it rough, my dad's like, no, I haven't had it rough. And I said, well, who's had it rougher than you? And he goes, well, um, Jesus has. And I was like, wow, I about fell off his bed in shock from him saying that. That's amazing. So yeah. how much longer did you have with him before he transitioned? And my um, the whole the whole entire day. Oh my God. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, after we were done talking, he's like, you got any questions? And I said, well, I don't know what to ask you. You know, I said, it's too late for you to show me how to use your tools. Cause he was really protective of his tools and didn't like, you know, me messing with his tools. So he, and he apologized for all that. He wished that he wasn't so strict. And my dad did 22 years in the army. And, um, so I, I said, that's all right. You know? And so he's like, well, I guess I'm ready to go. And my mom goes, well, I don't know how that works. Maybe you got to go to sleep. So we let him go back to sleep and um, we go out to the um, living room and she's telling me what had happened that night. And we're thinking he had gone back to sleep and we're waiting for him, maybe pass away. We didn't know what to expect. So a few hours go by and we hear him calling out from the bedroom. So we go in there to check on him and he's all shocked and surprised to see us. He's like, what are you guys doing here? And we're like, we live here. And he's like, you mean they didn't come and get me? I'm still alive. And we're like, yeah. And my mom was like, I don't know how this works. She goes, maybe they're giving you a free day or something, you know? And he goes, well, I'm starved. 
so here we're like, well, what would you like? He's been on a liquid diet for almost a month. And um, so we're asked, you know, do you want a smoothie? Do you want some soup? You know, we're asking the typical stuff that he used to have. And he's like, no, I want a real meal. He's like, grab my wallet off my dresser, go to the grocery store and buy me a meal that I would like. And so I told my mom, I said, all right, I'll run as fast as I can to get there. And I ended up getting some uh, steak, uh, crawfish and corn on the cob and some red potatoes and um, even grabbed a six pack of beer in case he wanted that. And even grabbed a, a movie to watch. If you wanted to see a movie, I grabbed a comedy and um, got home. Yeah. And got home and he's walking around in the kitchen, prepping the kitchen to help me cook, cook the meal. Can I ask you this? When, yeah. when he was walking around the kitchen, was he translucent or what was? was no, he, he was solid. Was he was, he wasn't a spirit. He was just himself. And he was just like healthy. He didn't look sick at all. So he, maybe he never died. Or maybe he did die. And they, it's. It, yeah. You, Cause my mom, my mom took his pulse. He was dead for at least a half hour. Oh and she God. heard him take his last breath. And then all she went to go to tell me he had passed away. And then he sat right up out of the bed. You know, going, whoa, where are you going? I need to talk to you. <laughs> what shock. This is insane. Us. This is so yeah. amazing, man. This is a yeah. mind blowing story. And, and, and it's a, it's a, what would you, would you call this? I mean, I know I saw here in your, um, in your, uh, your, your, your bio that you contributed to the book Afterlife Encounters, Ghost Spirits, and Near Death Experiences. Right. I love talking about near death experiences, but I would call this more like a shared death experience, right? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 maybe one of the first cases of a, a shared death experience because like and then did this kind of reframe the whole how much longer did this last and then what happened? Um, well, we had our dinner and then after dinner, we, we went to the living room and went through family, you know, photos and movies. And then he said he wanted to go back to his own bed. So we went in there and watched some TV and shared family stories again. By that time, it was almost midnight. And he goes, I'm exhausted. I'm, I need to go to sleep. And he goes, if I don't wake up in the morning, just let you know, I love you and everything's going to be okay. You don't have to worry about me. And if I can, I'll give you some signs from the other side. If I can come back and let you know that I'm around and we're like, okay, <laughs> so we're like all in shock. So we said, or said our goodbyes and good night. And the next morning, about eight o'clock in the morning, the doorbell rings and my mom comes in my bedroom. She's like, Hey, hospice is here and i said oh okay we'll let him in and she's like no you don't understand your dad's back in a coma all the color is gone you know he's back to where he was and she goes so, and he go ahead so he in the middle of the night his body went from your house back to hospice without you guys even taking him there. no no he was under hospice care at home he was in his own bed and um so when my mom woke up to check on him she had slept on the couch. He was in his own bed. And, and when she woke up, she found him back to his old state, you know, and uh, so hospice comes in, they go to the hospital bed, see, he's not there. And they're upset. They thought we transferred him to his own bed that we wanted him to die in his own bed. And we're like, no, it's not like that. <laughs> we're like yesterday, he was walking around and talking to us. And they thought we were crazy. They didn't believe us. So I told my mom, I said, it's okay. You know, we know what happened yesterday um let them think whatever you know we know we didn't do wrong and so they transferred him back into the hospital bed and he passed away three days later oh my god that's such an amazing story man like did now did, did this kind of frame the different frame the way you thought from here on out about the paranormal or at least yeah in general um it, it helped fuel it um, he, he made contact after his death. Like one of the things I asked him was, what are you going to miss, you know, on this side? And he had said, well, I had worked hard for some of these plants I planted on our property. He had planted a pineapple plant, an orange tree and an avocado tree. And he says, I never got a damn fruit off of them. I worked my butt off to get them. And he goes, I never got to try one off it. So that year, um, it was amazing. I go to my mom. I said, what are the odds of that? I said, all three of those plants he had mentioned every one of those only produced two fruit, one for my mom and one for me to have, which, you know, pretty odd odds. I thought, especially an orange tree, it only produced two oranges, which is supposed to make a bunch of oranges. And then the avocado tree, same thing. And then the pineapple produced two pineapples on it. So the years after that, it was just multiple fruit on those, which we thought was a, a his way of saying, Hey, 
you know, I'm thinking of you kind of deal. But after his uh, death, um, for almost about five days, um, the window that was next to his hospital bed, a red cardinal would tap on on the window at the hour that he passed away the second time he had passed away in the afternoon. And I go to my mom and said, hey, you know, this cardinal keeps on showing up on the time that dad passed away. And I said, do you think that's a message? He said he was going to send us a message. And she's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, that's his favorite bird, you know, songbird. And she goes, uh, maybe that's a message from him. And as soon as we said that, the cardinal stopped tapping on the glass and never came back after that. That's amazing. So let me ask you this. Do you think, do you ever, did you ever think about like how they, they might be able to manipulate reality like that? Like, um, yeah. you know, it's, the, do you think they become the bird or like what? Uh, I don't know if they become the bird, but they, I think they're able to maybe communicate with it or, you know, I, that's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, um, maybe on the other side, it's like, um, you know, we're, we're all more one. We're, we're all right. more connected. Like consciousness exists like in a, in a flow state. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you went and you attended the Rhine Research Center for studying parapsychology. Parapsychology, I, yeah. I interviewed, um, I'm trying to think of, is it Trey Hudson? who is investigating the Meadow Project. It's like the South Skinwalker Ranch. And I, mm-hmm. I, I've heard of the, the Rhine Research Center. There was a lot of like, uh, like I think Will, William Roll was there. Is that right? There was, there was a lot of like- Lumen. Yeah, Lloyd Albright was the instructor I had when I was there. Oh, okay. I had Lloyd on my show, I, you know, because yeah. I, I heard him on Art Bell. And then yeah. I, um, I liked him because he was very evidence-based. You know, and uh, he uh, right. it seems like he, he he's, he's a believer in the paranormal, but he's a little bit skeptical, but he's. Oh, like, yeah. He was skeptical of my you know experience because he's like, how did you have so many experiences? And I go, I wish I do. That's why I'm taking your course. <laughs> That's what I want to know. Hey, wait, let me ask you this. Have you had more experiences besides the one you told me about and then the one with your dad? You've had more to go. So- oh, yeah. I've had multiple experiences. I've lost count. It, it's it's crazy. Um so my dad, he still made contact at the day of his funeral. My mom and I came home and my jukebox, I had asked her, I said, do you want to listen to music on the jukebox or um, watch TV, watch the news? And she's like, I'd rather watch the news. So I said, all right. So I made this dinner for her and I bring her out to dinner and I went back out to the kitchen to get mine. Well, then all of a sudden I hear the jukebox selecting a record and playing this song. And I yell out to her, I said, hey, did you decided to listen to music and she goes no i thought you selected it and i said i'm not even near the jukebox how can i select it so i come out there and it's all lit up and uh i go over to to turn it off and i the back switch the off switch is on the back of it so i go to the back of it i look down i go no way and she's like what and i pick up the plug and it's not even in the outlet and i hold the plug up in the air and i show her and she's like no way and i said well listen to the song it picked and we had Garth Brooks song in there. The song was if tomorrow never comes. And um, it's a song about uh, letting someone know, wonder if they're going to, if they knew how much they loved them, you know, when they pass away kind of deal. And uh, so she's like, Oh my God, she goes, is it a message from dad? And I said, well, we just came back from his funeral. And as we're talking about the lights dimmed down the jukebox and the record came to a slow stop. That's amazing. What, so yeah. Your dad was able to have amazing control over like, his afterlife reality, it seems. Yeah. Like, like, well, he contacted me. I went Christmas shopping that year because he did Christmas really big. And so it was the first Christmas without him. So I wanted to make it extra special for my mom. And so I was buying Christmas gifts. And as I was coming out of the store, I just purchased a four foot tall angel for my mom for a Christmas gift. And all of a sudden I smelled cigar smoke and my dad used to smoke cigars. And I thought someone was being rude and I'm looking around, there's nobody around. So I get in the car. And I start smelling cigar smoke in my car and I hear my dad's voice, not audibly, but in my head. And it's him telling me to go to the store that he has something there for me. And I'm like thinking I'm crazy. I'm like, what? And then all of a sudden he's like, no, you need to go. So I talked out loud in my car going, uh, it's on my list to go, but it's way on the other side of the town. I'll get there sometime later today. And I hear my dad upset going, no, you need to go now. You need to go there now. So I end up driving there. And the cigar smoke disappeared in the car on the way there. Didn't hear. And I walk into the store. And as soon as I walk in the store, I see something on a display case. And I hear his voice. And he goes, uh, don't look at that. You need to go down far left aisle, all the way down the end. Look down your left side. 
and you'll 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 know what I'm talking about. So I get down there, and sure enough, as an item that it, this Japanese food gourmet store, my dad used to make amazing dinners. He he lived in Japan for about three years, so he learned how to cook from over there. So he had wanted this item from the store for years and they finally got it in stock. So I went and bought it all. I go up to the register and the lady's like, oh my God, you're not buying all this, are you? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, we have a loyal customer. He's been wanting this for a long time. That's the reason we got it. And we haven't heard from him or seen him in a long time. We're hoping he would come in because he's usually here during the holidays. And so I pulled out my wallet and showed a picture of my dad. And I said, is this the guy? And she goes, yeah. And I said, well, he passed away in June. And she and I'm a son, so I would think he would want me to have it. She was just like in shock. She was like, oh, my gosh, that's you know amazing. But I didn't tell her what brought me in there. And uh, as I'm going out, I heard my dad's voice in my head say, you know, Merry Christmas to you and your mom. And oh, did, yeah, was it already bought, too? Like, did you just have to pick it up? No, I had to buy it. Oh, they had, they had put it out because it's still I, amazing, though. That's amazing. Yeah. Story. Like, this is so amazing. Like, now, wh what other contact have you had? Well, have you had contact with other ghosts as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, he passed away in June. And then August of that year, I ended up going through an extreme haunting from 94 to 2000. And 94 and 95 was like the worst time frame of it. It was the most intense, where I was physically dragged out of bed, thrown into walls and things thrown at me. And that was connected to my dad's past. We found out. Well, how, well, okay, you got to tell me about this. This is okay. on the edge of my so, seat. This is amazing. What happened? So I woke up when it was around three o'clock in the morning and I thought someone had broken in the house. I could feel like a presence in my bedroom. And so I tried to get to the headboard to turn on my light and I slept with a gun because I'm ex-police. Uh, I was a police officer in the Air Force. And uh, so I went to reach for that. And before I could get to it, I felt two hands grab me by the ankles and start pulling me off the bed. And I break free, climb back up to the headboard. And before I could get to it, so I felt like someone jumped on my back, and pushed my face into the pillow. And um, I'm trying to escape, scream. I'm screaming because I'm living with my mom at the time, trying to let her know that uh, you know someone's in the house. And when I finally broke free, got my gun, turned on the light, and nobody's in my room. And my bedroom door was closed. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? And, you know, here I'm terrified. I get up, I go wake her up and let her know she, her bedroom was on the opposite side of the house. So I get over there and I wake her up and I'm explaining what happened. And she's like, well, maybe you're having uh, PTSD from the Gulf War. And I said, no, it was nothing like that. And I said, I was awake and alert during it all. So she goes to the restroom to wash her face, to wake up. And she comes out and, um, I hear something coming down the hallway and I thought it was my dog. I have this big Akita dog, which is like a big, you know, like Husky type dog. Yeah. And um, I thought that was coming down the hallway. Well, all of a sudden this force of energy hits me square in the chest and lifts me off her bedroom floor there. It knocks me back about eight to 10 feet into her bedroom wall. And she witnesses it. She's in shock. She's like, are you okay? Did you lose your balance? I said, how do I lose my balance from there to here? I said, I just got tackled. It felt like someone tackled me like a football tackle. And, and she thought I was, you know, crazy at the moment and then all of a sudden I said I'm being grabbed I was totally paralyzed and she could see all the hair on me standing up on end and that lasted for almost a full half hour it just kept on grabbing me and attacking me and my mom was amazing she's staying calm all through it and she even goes well let me take your blood pressure when it's grabbing you so my blood pressure ends up being high when it was holding me. And as soon as it, I said, it released me. And she's like, yeah, I, I could feel it's gone. Cause she could feel the like electrical current when she touched me, she could feel like this tingling sensation going through when she, when I was being grabbed and she take my blood pressure and it would be normal. She's like, that shouldn't be, that doesn't make sense. And after it was over with, we go, where's my dog? And we went to look for her and she was cowering underneath the kitchen table. there, terrified. So um, the next day we're talking about it. She calls my grandmother to tell her about it on the phone. And I said, well, I'm going to go grab something on my bedroom real quick. And as I'm going to the bedroom, I, was, I thought my dog was following me and something grabbed me in the bear hug. And I was totally paralyzed. And she's like, oh, my God, he's being attacked again. Just like last night. She's telling my grandmother on the phone. And then so they broke out into prayer. And she's touching me and I felt it, you know, let go of me. And and then from then on. Yeah, prayer worked. Prayer definitely worked. And, um, but from that on, I just constantly attacked. I would come home from work and you could just feel that energy shift in the house. 
and I would have something thrown at me from one of the, you know, tables or I'd have uh, light bulbs would explode when I turn on lights. We had track lighting in the bed and the living room area and you would see the light bulbs all strobing on and off. And um, once in a while, light bulbs would explode. And um, so during that time when my dad passed away around July, we had our first day that we were able to relax. So we went out for a drive and we saw a psychic fair and I was pretty skeptical of psychics. And my mom was like, hey, let's stop there. So she was getting a reading and the lady that was working the event goes, do you want a reading? And I said, well, do you have anybody that works with the police? I said, they got to be legit. You know, I said, I want something that's legit. And she goes, yeah, we have one lady that actually works with the local police and state police. And I, and I said, I'll take her. And so I met her and she did an amazing reading on me. So I contacted her and I said, hey, are you able to tell if a house is haunted? And she's like, yeah, I can tell you what's there. But I she goes, I don't think I can get rid of it, but I can at least tell you what's there. And um, so she came in and soon she walked in the house. She was terrified. She's like, you got three nasties here. And I go, OK. And she goes, they're connected to your dad. And she goes, was your dad military? And I said, yeah, and he was in the army. And she goes and I and she goes, was he in a war? And I said, yeah, Vietnam War. And she goes, this is connected to the Vietnam War. And then she goes, wow, your dad was not a typical infantry soldier. And I said, no, he wasn't. He was with uh, Mac V. He was an advisor. And then she goes, well, he did a little more than that. He was clandestine. And um, she said these three guys were on a wanted to go do a personal gang mission to make some money. And supposedly my dad is, wasn't going to partake in it. And they got killed. And they've been supposedly haunting my dad from Vietnam on because they were pissed off that they were killed, that they thought um, if he was there, they may have been alive kind of deal. And so we always chalked up as nightmares and everything was PTSD from the war. She goes, my, some of it might have been, but she goes, I feel they were attacking them. And now that your dad's crossed over, they're mad that he crossed over. So they're now taking it out on you. So your dad wasn't then able to help you because he had already crossed over, but these spirits were he, working yeah, she, around. Yeah, she said that she goes, you might be able to call for your dad for help, you know, and she goes, you might see him manifest and fight these guys out. And I'm like, OK, I said that I'd love to see him, but I don't know if I could handle seeing that. You know, you know that sounded terrifying. But during that time, we had like a neighbor. He was a, a, a Baptist minister and he came over with some other ministers to do a, a like a cleansing of the house. and. You, I go to my mom. She goes, do you think that helped? I said, oh, no. I said, I can feel the energy in this house. It is not good. And all of a sudden, all the bedroom doors started slamming shut. And you could see your breath in the air. And I said, it's pissed. And I got attacked that night where I was, you know, slammed into my headboard, and pushed out of bed. And oh my God. Uh, yeah, so um, as time went on, things were getting worse, you know. And how um, did you, uh, um, can I ask you this? How yeah. did you manage to live a normal life like with this going on like was it hard oh it was very stressful yeah my mom um she was a school teacher and she tried to confide with a a, a friend of hers and um the principal heard about it and they thought my mom was crazy talking about the haunting events and she had to go get a psycho veil to keep her job for teaching but yeah because it was very taboo back then like yeah yeah it's not, it's not as exciting now it's yeah accepted like you know it's like now like people have to uh disclose to you if they're selling you right house. yeah this like, is back in the 90s you know yeah mid -90s. I, i'm gonna say i'm probably the same age as you my dad was in vietnam as well and and uh you know i'm 42 so i you yeah. know, i don't know we're probably close to the same age but I yeah mean, i'm in my mid 50s oh okay but um you know these are just amazing stories so did you try to go to like a church or something to try to? Yeah, we we went to the cat. We weren't Catholic, but we went to the Catholic church because you see all you know the paranormal movies, the Exorcist. So we're like, hey, maybe the Catholics can help us. So we went to a, a Catholic priest and talked to him, and he had said, uh, "I'll talk to the diocese in Orlando." This took place in Florida, and um, he got back with us and he said, "Sorry, since you're not Catholic, they won't let me come in and do a blessing of your home." And he felt bad. He gave me his personal rosary. He says, maybe this will protect you, you know. And I carried that. And that, that seemed to help for a bit. And um, so down the road, my mom had a student that was Indian. And she, she uh, learned that his father was a medicine man. So she contacted him and said, I was wondering if you could help us or point us in the right direction. And he's like, yeah, I can do a 
a cleansing ceremony for your house. And he spent about eight hours doing a cleansing ceremony in our house. And that helped out a lot. And then he also taught me a lot during that, how to not fear it. Cause he says, if you fear it, it's going to um, help with its energy, you know, and get stronger and told me to stand up to it. You know, you need to fight it. And I'm like, well, that's easier said than done. You know, being an ex police officer, you're, you're used to grabbing someone and throwing handcuffs on them, but how do you grab something that doesn't have a physical body? And he goes, well, you got to fight mind wise, you know, you got to be strong mentally and um, not fear it. And he says, it'll fight for a while, but after a while, it's, it's like a bully, the way he described it. He says, after a while, it'll get weaker and weaker over time, you know, you standing up to it. And that's exactly what I did after that. Um, the cleansing, nothing happened for a full year after he cleansed. And my mom went on vacation and I had the house to myself. And it was about two or three in the morning. I got woken up with my Akita ran into the bedroom and jumped on my bed terrified and I'm like what's going on and I could just feel that energy that energy I had felt for almost a year and I said oh my god and then all of a sudden every door in the house you could hear them and see them just opening and closing and opening and closing and I sat up out of the bed you know I said I I'm not afraid I said bring it on let's get it over with you know and I'm cussing and screaming and all the doors came to a dead stop and uh, felt the energy go away so after that things would happen but when I saw it, I would just laugh, go, not impress, you know, and it just got less and less over time. And during that time period, I met my wife, we were dating and she witnessed stuff in the house. You know, she saw shadow figures in the house and um, she witnessed, uh, we had six picture frames on the bathroom wall. She witnessed all six of the frames all moving like this on the wall <laughs> at the same time, well, which flew her away. I was going to say, do you think like, the fact that she saw shadow beings there, do you think that this was maybe a portal as well? Like, do you have maybe a portal yeah. in your house? Yeah, it could be. I don't know. But when we had the psychic come over, that that was probably the most terrifying. She she literally ran out of the house. She had came in and said, um, I'm going to light this candle. And it was a big white candle, about six inches circumference, you know, and about six inches tall. And she put it in the middle of our coffee table. And she says, this lets me know the energy and watch the flame, you know, that'll tell you if there's a spirit in the room. So I said, hey, I have some tea candles. I don't have any big candles like that, but I have these little tea camp votive candles. And she's like, yeah, light a bunch of those and put them across your fireplace mantle. So I had about like six or eight of those across the mantle. And she was going around the house and she says, they like your room a lot. And she goes, I feel their presence in your bedroom. And you could see your breath when you walked in my bedroom. That's how cold it was. Oh my and, God. And this is Florida. Yeah. We may have had the AC on, but it was not supposed to be that cold in the room. And she goes, go grab a, do you have a Bible? And my mom goes, yeah, we have a huge, you know, family Bible. And um, she goes, go open that up. And and read that. So I open it up and she goes, place it on your bed. And then she goes, Mike, go get some white paper and cut some crosses out of them and then tape them on your room. I was like, okay. So I went to go get some paper and my mom and one of our family friends was there as a witness when we had the uh, psychic go, because we wanted someone to witness this, you know, besides ourselves. And I hear them scream and I come running, you know, what's wrong? And they, and my bedroom doors closed. And I go, why is my bedroom door closed? And I go, well, it just slammed in front of our face. It just closed. And they said the Bible literally was flipping pages through it and lifted off the bed and slammed shut. And when the book slammed shut, then the door slammed in their face. And I was like, no way. Because I hadn't witnessed it. So she's like, go in there. <laughs> go open the Bible. So I go in there and it's like ice, ice cold. I open the Bible, I step back from it and the pages start flipping on it. Like, you know, like a heavy fans blowing across the book. It was crazy. And I said, I'm not standing in the room. So we all stepped out of my bedroom watching it. And then the, again, the Bible lifted up, slammed shut and the bedroom door slammed in our face. And she goes, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. I can't help you anymore. You need clergy or something else better than me. And she went out to the living room to get her candle, which was this big candle. And it was totally melted on, on the, on the coffee table, blew her away. And she had put it on a silk scarf. So she took all the hot melted wax, the scarf and all threw it in her bag. And, and, and then I go, Hey, did you see the tea candles on the, on the fireplace? And she gasped and she's like, Oh my God, I gotta go. I gotta go. And all the tea candles on the fireplace, the flames were about a foot high on all the, all the candles. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think this was something even maybe like, do you think she might've missed, uh, miss uh 
he might have. He was meant to make something demonic. This sounds so very demonic. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Or do you think spirits, from your experience in the paranormal, do you think spirits and demons can be one and the same? That they're they're just like an evil spirit? Is a I demon? think I think if you're a bad person, you could be a bad spirit on the other side. I've gone to you know I've gone to investigations and people are being pushed and touched and I'll on my recorder I'll have you know a spirit say get out f you and cuss and stuff like that I don't feel it's demonic I've had teams go oh well we think it's demonic I go why because we had an EVP that said get out I go, well that doesn't make it as evil yeah I mean you're you, you're being viewed as maybe an intruder in the home you know so you got to go back and say why'd you tell us to get out it doesn't automatically make it evil by just that you know yeah. so but we we had a, uh, another psychic come in and she said the same thing that she believed it was connected to my dad's experience in the military oh, i yeah. wonder what your dad was doing in the military did you ever find out yeah i did some i, mean, I did some research and he worked with the cia over there and oh. yeah yeah he did some deep clandestine stuff and uh um my mom you know back in the day she was saying well i guess i was pretty naive back then and uh i was like yeah when the guy's having lunch every year with the director of the cia i would say that's <laughs> you know got some connection there and I, I ended up uh researching on various boards and reaching out to people to see if they knew my dad you know during the war and i had a person contact me and confirm a lot of the you know things that we were trying to find out amazing stuff man this yeah. is so good like so um how did you ever clear the did, you, or did they just finally like just decide to leave they, it, it got we, it got weaker and weaker as time went on and i ended up moving out in 2000 got married and um it wasn't until i think it was 2004 or 2005 my mom's other house that she had in florida she uh, sold that and moved to tennessee where i am now and um i helped with the closing on the house so i went there to get the house all prepped and when i walked in the house i was the only one there and i walked in the house and i felt that same feeling from her other house and i said oh my god i said i haven't felt this in years and all of a sudden i get, was grabbed in a bear hug i was totally paralyzed and i ran out of the house called my wife on on the cell phone and said uh um, you won't believe what I just encountered. I said, I'm not going back in there. The realtor and all them could go in there, but I'll be waiting outside. I said, no. Nope. And then um, when I make, when I was doing the research and made contact with this guy that knew my dad, I guess, because all the research, there was one day here in Tennessee, um, my wife took the kids and they had gone shopping. And I was relaxing in the living room and I decided I thought I was going to take a nap on the couch. And as I'm laying there, all of a sudden I felt that energy I hadn't felt since Florida. And I was like, oh, crap. And then all of a sudden, they're standing in my living room at the entranceway, where this guy in um, Vietnam, Vietnam camouflage fatigues, tiger stripe, and uh, had a scarf over his face with an orange scarf wearing a, a beret, and immediately knew that it was connected, you know, with the haunting in, in, in Florida. And I said, I'm not afraid of you, you know, and it came walking in the room and lunged right at me. And um, I could see through the scarf where there's decay in, in, in his face, where you could see some of the skeletal there. And oh uh, yeah, it terrified me. I was paralyzed when it came lunging at me. And I screamed out. All I could do was get like a moan out. And then it just poof, he was gone. And that, that, that was scary. And I think it was just him saying, hey, you know, you're getting too close learning about us kind of deal. So I just this backed off. This is amazing. Yeah. This is so, I mean, like, so what ended up happening? Like, this is so good. Like, um, well, I just went on, you know, with my life kind of deal. You know, I just. You, you, I guess you just learned to live, right? Yeah. Just learned to deal with it. Um, the house I moved in, we moved here in Tennessee in 2005. Um, we hadn't even got furniture in. I was setting up a folding table at my basement, uh, finished basement where I put my office at. And, um, I was setting up the table and put my computer up and all of a sudden here comes this lady down the stairs. And I first thought it was my wife coming down to bring me a glass of water or something. And then I noticed it's not my wife. And this lady was in a vintage white dress and her hair is up in a bun. She come gliding down the stairs and stopped and looked right at me and smiled. And um, I'm like, oh, crap. You know? <laughs> and then she just 
went across the whole room and went right through the wall. And I yelled out to the wife. I said, holy cow, we moved into a haunted house. And because all I was thinking is Florida. I was like, I don't want to go through that again. And uh, but we've learned in this house, um, they're all friendly and um, we all coexist, you know, fine. So we have multiple ones from uh, little kids um, and uh, several uh, other spirits that show up from time to time. So it's almost like Beetlejuice. Remember Beetlejuice with Michael Keaton? Like, right. Yeah. yeah. A, that was a great movie. Remember the ghosts? Yeah. They're trying to learn the handbook of how to uh, interact with humans. Like, cause they don't want the, they don't want the people to live there. I thought that that was, a great movie on the paranormal i think because right. a lot of times hollywood like will can portray something that like that that kind of like relates to real life and i thought that that movie was just great did you did you what did what was your reactions to that movie being someone who, yeah like, i think some of them you know they nailed it you know on the head i think how spirits interact I think sometimes they're, you know, they're happy, you know, like a new family's moving in and they, they like how things are going in the house. And then I think sometimes when people are having negativity stuff in their house, they don't like it. I had a case uh, in Nashville where I helped out this family where the guy was remodeling the house and he was going in the bathroom and found out there was another wallpaper behind his wallpaper and he wanted to remove it. And once he started working removing that wallpaper he was having all kinds of issues with his tools tools were being moved or missing or they would suddenly die when you you know try to use the electrical and um and then his kids start saying they were seeing this you know shadow figures in the hallway and stuff like that and through research i brought in a psychic medium she got a name and it matched to uh, a prior owner of the house and it was a, a lady that was she liked the wallpaper that was her favorite wallpaper so we had him sit down and like he was talking to her i said she might be in this room i don't know but talk to her like she's sitting in the chair across from you and explain you're the new owner and that why don't you take some of the wallpaper and cut it out and frame it and just you know hang it on the wall as a, a picture or something as an appeasement and uh, after that activity it came worked. down yeah that yeah, worked Wow, that's pretty cool. So, yeah. I mean, what, what, have you had all you you you've been dedicated a lot of time to being a paranormal investigator? Have you seen uh, how many real haunting cases would you say you've seen? Like, of, oh uh, god, a uh, lot, like, like hundreds. <laughs> um, well, I've done over about two hundred investigations, but it's. I count, you know, each time returning to a place. So, um, I've gone to a lot of multiple places. When I work on a case, I I tell the clients. You know, it's not a quick fix. It's not like you see on TV. It's going to be done in a day or two. Sometimes it can take a long time. Like I had a case in North Nashville that took me over a year to find out all what was going on and why the reasonings were happening. And um, but I've witnessed a lot on quite a few cases. And I've also done uh, charity events to help raise money for like historical locations. And one of my favorites was I had a family of five at the Civil War plantation. And um, all my equipment's going crazy. We're in the basement, the Civil War house. And they're like, what's going on? And I said, I don't know. I've never seen it this active with the equipment. I said, but something I feel big is going to happen. And then out of the darkness in the corner of the room, this lady goes, uh, there's a man standing in that corner. Do you see him? And I said, yeah, I see him. All of us saw him, which is great. You know, having multiple witnesses seeing an apparition. And then I talked to it. I said, I see you standing there. And uh it suddenly, you know, stepped back into the darkness and vanished. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is amazing but, stuff. Man. Yeah, well, we've had a lot of cases. And then, like, my house, um, my wife and, and my son and daughter have both seen, you know, full body apparitions in the house, you know, multiple times over the years. Wow, that's so, uh, this is so amazing. So what do you think that, I mean, like, what, what, after researching all this time, what do you think the afterlife is? Have you had... Have you thought about it? And what do you think? Um, I think like my wife, may, we were talking about one time and she had said, you know, because I don't think the gates are locked, at, you know, at heaven, you know, I think you can come and go. And I said that that's a possibility. And because, um, you know, like my dad's made connections over the years on and off. And um, so I think they can come visit from time to time. Well, what do you think about the tape loop type ghost? I'm sure you've had to encounter that, right? What, what's that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The tape loop type ghost, you know, like um, you would hear it. Oh, like they now, repeat like, over and over. Or? Yeah, like it's like a like it's like a, a glitch in the matrix type thing. Right. You know? Yeah, it could be a uh, um, like a residual. You know, it's it's say like this woman's seen every night at 
1 a.m. in the morning going across the hallway, then I would say that's like a residual of energy that it's on a, some type, some reason it got recorded. You know, it's repeating itself. Now, it's when they turn and look at you and, and they talk to you or answer you, then that would make it intelligent, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's so interesting. So um, what have you, did you uh, present a lot of these cases to Void or when you were going there, have you not started investigating the paranormal yet? Like what, when you were... Um, I started the paranormal in uh, 2006. I moved in Tennessee in 2005 and we had all kinds of encounters in the house. And then there was one day I was watching this paranormal show on TV and they were helping this family. And at the end of the show, I said, oh my God, I don't think they helped that family at all. They left them still wondering what's causing all this or, and then left them terrified at the end of it. I said, that's awful. So I go to my wife, I said, maybe there's a team in the Nashville area that can use my experience and let people know that they're not crazy, that this stuff's real. Yeah. And since mine's so, you know, extreme and over the top, you know, and let people know that, yeah, that this stuff can happen. So I had found the team and worked with them for about a year. And later on, I just didn't like the direction they were going. So my wife suggested, she goes, maybe just start your own. And I did that. And, um, and then I started doing like guest speakings and sharing my experiences with people. Oh, this is amazing. Um, well, I, I don't have any other questions. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions. Um, no, no I, I just, uh, well, can you tell everybody, like, if, if, are you currently re, uh, investigating? And if they want to get investigations, how can people find you? Um, you can find me at, uh, um, at our website, which is vsparanormal.com. And we have contact information on there. Or you can contact us through Facebook by going to Volunteer State Paranormal Research on Facebook. And then we can, I just want to say, have you ever had any encounters with what, what we would think of as a demonic entity? Um, the closest I ever had that something was really severely negative. I, I was working a case in Nashville and um, we were all sitting in a circle in this basement of this old school and um, doing an EVP session. And one of the team members goes, Mike, you just disappeared. I go, what do you mean I disappeared? He goes, I can't see you sitting in the chair anymore. It's just a big black mass. And, and then all of a sudden I said, well, my left ear is like on fire. It's suddenly feeling hot. And the psychic medium that was there, she says, I think you're being attacked. You need to leave the room. So I tried to get out of the chair. And, and when I stood up, I felt this big paw of a hand on my shoulder and push me back into the chair. And she's like, are you going to leave? And I said, I'm trying to leave. And finally got up. They said they saw like a ball of light about the size of a golf ball follow me out the door when I was walking out of the room. And I got outside and my left ear was beat, beat red. And um, the next day I called up team leader. I said, you won't believe this. I said, I just looked in the mirror. I said, my ears peeling like I had a bad sunburn. Oh my so God. yeah, that's about that the only was. thing I've had. Yeah. That was like any physical, you know, harm I've been pushed, you know, I've seen people like that have been scratched. I've never been scratched myself, but I've seen people that have gotten scratched. Um, yeah, because I'm trying to, before we go, I, I'm just trying to figure out what our reality is. It's so strange. Right. It's a lot more stranger than we've ever even imagined. Like, the, you know, like what they talk about in movies, it's it's real. You know, it's, right. like, it's very real. And, and it's even realer than they portray it. You know, it's, yeah, it's it's it's, it's there, there used to be like a giggle, like 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 laugh factor at this stuff. But now I think at least it's being taken more a lot more. Seriously. It's definitely become more open, you know, because it was very taboo back in the 90s. You know, we tried not to share it with neighbors and even relatives. We shared it with relatives and some of them, you know, didn't want to hear about it. Um, and then like my mom almost lost her job. You know, she had to have a psychological evaluation to keep her job. And luckily, the. The psychiatrist believed, you know, what she had to share. That's like that's like like what, what they did with John Mack. You know, I don't know if you ever looked at like alien abduction cases, but John Mack was a Harvard professor who uh, he studied alien abduction cases, and they wanted to, you know, can him from his job. He was a he was a teacher, you know, right? He believed all these people were having abductions, and they, you know, they 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 found out that he was, you know, I guess the psychologist found out that he was you know, but he believed this, right. that it was real, you know, and it's right. just, it's so, it's so strange. Everything's so, so much stranger than we could ever imagine. Right. Yeah. Well, my experiences of, of, with helping with cases, I've some cases I don't even get to investigate when clients call me because after I talk to them, 
it's calmed him down because they'll call me up and I go, well, what's going on? And they go, well, I'm having an extreme haunting. And I go, well, what's extreme? And they go, well, we had a door slam shut or I got, you know, my foot touched, you know, and I like, well, no one's being pushed into walls or dragged out of bed. And, and they're like, does that happen? <laughs> I go, yeah, it does happen. And, and they're like, wow, no, I haven't had that. And then I explained to them, I go, well, what have you done new, you know, your house is there something going on and they'll explain, you know, a life change or something's going on. I said, maybe it's a relative that's worried about you. You know, you're going through a lot of stress. You know, I had, I had a guy call me, he was a uh, ex military and he called me on Super Bowl Sunday, terrified. And he's like, can you get down here now? And I said, what's going on? And he says, we we're watching the football game and my girlfriend and I were sitting there and also we saw this shadow figure standing in the archway by the bedroom door and uh, we're terrified. And I, and I said, well, I can't come today. One is Super Bowl Sunday. There's no way I'm getting a, a, any of my team members free. And I said, since nobody's physically harmed, I'll, I'll come, you know, on a, a later in the week and uh, so when I got down there I did an investigation and found out I asked him I said any life changes recently and he's like not that I can think of and I said what do you do and he was a contractor he was working for uh, Blackwater you know for like mercenary type work and um, I said did you lose anyone recently and he's like yeah matter of fact I did and I said well I have a recording uh, when I asked what's your name he goes I'm chief and I said, was your friend a chief petty officer or, or a warrant officer? Or, and he ended up being a petty officer. And uh, I said, I think your friend's worried about you. And him and I had a little talk and found out that, yeah, he was dealing with some stress and, and that. And uh, that ended the, the activity, but it helped him too with closure. I had him sit down and talk like his friend was sitting right across from him. So and do you, do you think that shadow people are spirits then from your I think so. Um, my theory is that just not a, it's not a full manifestation. And this is how I reached that theory is I worked at a museum here in town where I live at. And I was working there one day and my wife and daughter came in to help me. And we were just leaving the museum and I I went out the door first. And then all of a sudden my daughter grabs my wife's hand and goes, look, a ghost. And my wife's like, what? And my daughter and my wife had seen this lady in a Victorian dress going up the stairs. And by the time she was getting up to the top of the stairs, she was losing her um, color and everything because she was like, my daughter saw her perfectly solid in a green, like Victorian dress. And my wife, when she turned to look, she was just losing the color of her outfit and she was turning into a black mass, into a silhouette. And then she just dissipated vanished so she went from like a full manifestation to a shadow figure and then vanished now well, my last question is have you ever looked into orbs much because i've heard yeah, someone say yeah. That orbs are human consciousness as well do you think that i i truly believe that i mean there's the skeptics say it's all dust and moisture and yeah a lot of it is especially when you're taking photographs but i've seen orbs with the naked eye and i and when i share photos um, on my website or when I share them online, it's because we saw it with our naked eye and I took a picture of it while we saw it floating across the room. And I've seen them translucent that it looked like someone that just blew a bubble. And I've seen them uh, solid black and we've also seen them in color. And um, so can't explain it. We got on video, uh, we were investigating a public high school and we got on video a red ball of light floating around. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. This has yeah. been this has been amazing stuff, man. I I I I I don't even know what to say. I'm just like I'm amazed. This has been like ground jaw dropping, like ghost disclosure, really. Like, <laughs> thank you. Th thank you for taking your time to do this. This was amazing. Um, yeah, and and uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll send you a link when I upload. Okay, it. yeah, yeah, definitely will share it. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. All right, thanks, Mike. This was amazing. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. You too.